Welcome to Church History with Dave Doyle. I'm so excited that you have decided to join me on this great adventure. Look, I find church history life-changing, and I really believe that uh, given your study and the investment you're about to make, that it can be life-changing for you too. Hey, so welcome aboard. Thanks for joining me. Let's start. Today is lesson one, and today we're going to look at the issue of an introduction to church history. Uh, perhaps the best way is for you to know what you're about to get into. Uh, you need to know what the purpose of the course is so you can decide what it's going to take to really understand church history. So the purpose of this course is simple. The church history course is designed to bring to light the doctrine, devotion, and discipleship practices of the church from the time of the apostles to our present time. We're going to have a special emphasis on the providence of God and the principal ideas that shape the events of each age. This course is ideal for those seeking to understand history through a Christian world view. I mean, friends, what an exciting adventure uh, to look at church history in the big picture, to find out what the saints of the past have done, to understand how they have dealt with things throughout time and see the providence of God at work as he is unfolding history that brings about his glory and the good of his people. And then to understand those events and see how they shape the past, but how they help us think about how we should deal with the future. So what is my approach? Is this going to take you to become a scholar? Uh, no, there's a few things you need to know about the way I'm going to handle this course. Uh, first of all, this course is designed for beginners in church history. You don't have to have a background in it. You don't have to have a PhD in church history to get this. Uh, this is something that should be easy for you to attain and understand. Secondly, my approach is simple. I want to put the cookies on the bottom shelf and serve you as a common man's historian and theologian. But I want to warn you, though, that doesn't mean I'm going to dumb this down in any way. But rather, I refuse to make it harder for you to learn church history and to fall in love with it than is necessary. So I'd love for you to join me now as I define some terms today. Every single subject that we study, uh, whether it's drumming or it's cooking or whatever, there's really three things in starting to learn any subject. There's a grammar, a logic, and a rhetoric. A grammar is what are the words that are associated with that subject. Secondly, what is the logic? How are those words connected into a system? And thirdly, the rhetoric. How do I express it and how do I live it? If you were a drummer, it'd be this. You'd have to learn terms like snare and cymbal and sticks. Then you would see how do they work together to play music. And thirdly, the rhetoric is the expression or the making of music. Well, look, church history has its own grammar. It has words that you're going to have to get used to. So I want to start out by defining some of those words for you now. Uh, three basic terms that I want to define. First of all, church history. Secondly, universal church. And thirdly, local church. Let's start out by defining church history. Church history is this. It's the study of God's providential work of building his church from the day of Pentecost to today. When we say the day of Pentecost... Uh, we are talking about when the church began in Acts chapter 2, the day the Spirit came upon them and Peter preached, 5,000 were saved, and on that day the church began. The day of Pentecost until now is what we're talking about when we talk about church history. We're studying from that point until now. But secondly, we have to define the word church. When we say church, we have the first of all the word universal church. The universal church is everyone truly saved from the day of Pentecost until the rapture. Sometimes this universal church is called the invisible church. Let me say this about that. Uh, when we talk about it, it's from the beginning of the church in 33 AD until the rapture yet to come. What is the rapture? Just making sure we know the bookends of church history. And that is when Christ returns to take his church home to be with him in heaven and just before the beginning of the seven years described in the book of Revelation, those seven years of tribulation. Church history then is from 33 AD, the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, until the rapture, which is yet future. 
everyone saved during that period of time is part of the universal church, God's church, which is the body of Christ. But that's not the only definition we need to know. We also need to know that there's a local church. That's the church that you attend and I attend in our local places. And a definition that Hiscox says is this, a Christian church is a company of regenerate persons baptized on a profession of faith in Christ, united in covenant for worship, instruction, the observance of Christian ordinances, and for such service as the gospel requires, recognizing and accepting Christ as their supreme Lord and lawgiver and taking his word as their only and sufficient rule of faith and practice in all matters of conscience and religion. That's a long definition and I should really just say this. A local church is made up of professing believers, but they're not all Christians as we know. This is gonna help us in a few minutes when we talk about the key to understanding church history. What is that? Well, I'm gonna keep you in suspense for a minute, but just remember there's a distinction between the local church and the universal church. Universal church, all truly saved throughout the entire church age. The local church is made up of professing believers who are theoretically under the Lordship of Christ and under the Word of God, but not everyone there is truly saved. So let's then look at a little further definition of this as I'm stating. The local or visible church, as it's sometimes referred to, will be seen to be more pure, that is faithful to God's design for the church, or less pure, unfaithful to God's design for the church, as we look at the various time periods, movements, denominations, leaders, and geographic expressions of Christian faith. Hey, by keeping a proper distinction between the invisible and the visible church, we can avoid the classic extremes. Some people want to whitewash the activities that the church has done throughout history by saying it's always been good. Other people want to look at the church as having failed in every age. Those are extremes that we want to avoid. Uh, I should say that when we talk about more pure and less pure, we need to have that as a framework in our mind. Don't have your expectation of where do I see the perfect church over that time, nor has the church completely failed in its mission. But as we're going to note in a few minutes, the key to understanding church history is understanding the difference between those two and one other very vital ingredient. But, you know, before I get into the more academic points and we jump into all of that, I want to slow it down and really talk about my own personal love of church history. But what is it that has got so deep in my soul about this subject, why I want to share it with other Christians? And I've said in a big blanket statement, it, it has changed my life. But if you don't mind, come along on a little bit of a bio for me and understand what it is that has happened in my own life, why I love teaching church history. There are really five main people who've influenced me to get me to this point where I see church history is so vital for other Christians. First of all, my own mother, Daisy Doyle. Uh, Daisy Doyle is a four foot 11 uh, inch uh, Irish woman with red hair, flaming red hair. And Daisy Doyle taught me this. She taught me that story is important and people's biography, their story is important. And she was kind of the the historian of our entire family. Uh, she would keep me understanding how the different generations and how our family had come from Ireland and, and how we came to the United States. And I had a backdrop growing up of who I really was in a historical line because of my mother. With that love, I went to college, to a Bible college, and I had the privilege of studying under a man named Rembert Bird Carter. Uh, Dr. Carter was my church history and history professor, and I majored under him in that. And I fell in love with this, that he said, Dave, get back to the sources. Read them yourself. Get acquainted from people in church history and don't simply listen to what others say church history is. And today, in fact, at the end of today's lesson, I want to introduce you to the quotes of 10 Christians who've lived before us that can help us frame exactly why church history is important. But Dr. Carter taught me that and then he introduced me to Francis Schaeffer a philosopher and theologian who died in the 1980s but had a great impact on my thinking. And it was Francis Schaeffer who taught me this, that ideas 
have consequences. Ideas have consequences. Well, how does that relate to history? Well, you could look at it this way, that history is simply the consequences of the great ideas, that the events that take place are people just acting on their worldview, acting on their values, and the great ideas that they have absorbed and valued, they eventually do something with. And each age that we look at in church history, we're going to see prevailing ideas that the culture accepted, and in many cases the church accepted, which helps us to understand how they acted because of what they valued. As I began to look then at church history in a larger picture of seeing what were the big ideas, it began to frame my philosophy of teaching church history. I think it's possible to go through a church history course and learn a great deal about names and places and people and events, but not really understand what the big picture was. I mean, think about it this way. It's possible to read the entire Bible, but not really understand what the big picture is or what the point of it is. And so with history, it's important to understand what the big ideas were and how people responded in those ages so that you can be more comfortable saying, how does that big idea relate to today? My own church, my own family, my own nation. It was from there, though, that I was introduced to more of a, a technical aspect, a more professional church history approach. And I looked at Earl Carnes. Uh, Earl Carnes wrote a book uh, called Christianity Through the Centuries, and uh, it is still in print. Love to have you read it along if you'd like to. I'd encourage you to get it on your Kindle or order it from Amazon. But the point of it is, that book lays out in kind of a logical approach through 13 different segments of church history and helps us to emphasize the points under the great ideas and the major events. And I'll be taking some of that and bringing it to you today, and I encourage you on that book. But then finally, what really turned the corner for me to understand what I should do with church history is the character from the ancient church, Irenaeus. Uh, Irenaeus was a father of the church who lived uh, between 150 and about 200. And Irenaeus had followed Polycarp, who had followed John the Apostle. Irenaeus was early one of the defenders of the Christian faith when great persecution arose in the second century. And he wrote and helped me understand where he was in history and helped me to understand how to defend the Christian faith in my own time. Why do I say that? Because Irenaeus dealt with and wrote six books to defend against an ancient heresy, an ancient belief system that was wrong, attacked the Bible. And that heresy was called Gnosticism. He wrote and defended it in such a beautiful way that he's left us a legacy on how we should do it. Why is that important? Because in our own time, the Gnostic Gospels have been rediscovered. The, the Gospel of Thomas, the Gospel of Philip. And people are running around saying, how do we defend against this? And what I would say is very simple. Irenaeus already told us how to do it. So when I realized that the church had dealt with almost all the same issues, though packaged a little differently, I came to the approach of this, which is what I'm passing on to you. There are big ideas in each age that we need to understand how to deal with them because scripture addresses them. And secondly, God's people in the past, because of God's providence, have already dealt with those same issues from scripture. And while they haven't had the final word on everything, they are so instructive to us to go back and see how did they deal with things so that we could deal with things much deeper. In this regard, Francis Schaeffer uh, tells us something about history in that regard. He says this, there is a flow to history and culture. This flow is rooted and has its wellspring in the thoughts of people. People are unique in their inner life of the mind. What they are in their thought world determines how they act. This is true of their value systems. It's true of their creativity. It's true of their corporate actions, such as political decisions, and it's true of their personal lives. The result of their thought world flow through their fingers or from their tongues into the external world. So again, as Francis Schaeffer is simply telling us, it's this. Ideas acted upon have consequences. So here's what I want to do now. I want to give you the key today to understanding church history. Now, by the word understanding, I just want to say this. It's not how to unravel every event 
or to place it into a logical picture so that you know the, the, the where things happen and when, that's something we will go through. But this is a key to help you to get the right perspective on what is happening in church history. You understand what God's perspective on history is, what the church's role in history is, and what we've been told it will be. And so at this point, I want to introduce you to the key to understanding church history. This is the key. Jesus and the apostles told us in advance that the visible church would struggle, yet ultimately succeed in her mission. Now remember, when we defined earlier what the visible church is, it's the local church. It's the church that you and I go to. It's the church of every age and the church on each corner. So when Jesus and the apostles told us in advance that the visible local church would struggle throughout the church age, yet ultimately succeed in our mission, we can hold in tension those two things. When we look at church history, we're going to look at it and see the church has greatly struggled at times. In fact, it has appeared at times to have failed. But what we also know in counterbalance is that Jesus says that the church will succeed in its mission of accomplishing God's will and will ultimately succeed in his purposes. So let me give you a few ideas of how the church has been more pure at times and less pure at times so you can get your head around that. First of all, Jesus warned us, as I've said, he told us there'd be wheat and tares. That is, there will be believers and unbelievers throughout this entire church age. So whenever you go to a church, no matter how pure that church appears, no matter how wonderful the people are, there's still always going to be wheat and tares who struggle within the local church throughout the age. Secondly, Paul planted churches in that first century. He planted churches that are like Ephesus and Philippi. that were great churches. But then he also had Galatia, where he said, I am really surprised that you so quickly have left the gospel. Or the Corinthians, where he had to write them two letters because they were off on almost everything. Uh, when people say, man, we got to get back to the New Testament church and start practicing it, I just have to ask, uh, which church are you talking about? There was never a pure church in the most perfect sense, but there are churches that are more pure and less pure according to God's demands of the church. Thirdly, let me just remind you that the seven churches of the book of Revelation existed. At the end of that first century, Jesus died, buried, and rose again 33 AD. By 95 AD, John the Apostle is the last living apostle, and he writes the book of Revelation, the revelation of Jesus Christ to the churches. And in it, seven churches are described, as you know. But there's some really bad churches by the end of that first century of churches, the churches look something like this. Ephesus, Smyrna, and Philadelphia, good churches. But Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, and Laodicea, in which Jesus said of Laodicea, you're lukewarm. I, I want to spit you out of my mouth. The church was struggling at times in history. And that picture both told us it happened in the first century. And by way of example, I believe it helps us understand that it would occur throughout the ages. You know, in 1 Corinthians 11, uh, Paul tells us that there has to be divisions among us in the church age. Why? Because those who are approved, God's true servants, would be made manifest or they would be made to be known. It's divisions and it is heresies and attacks against the church, which demonstrate to God's true people how they should really act in opposition to that. Hey, let me just say this. Jesus had 12 men who followed him. A one of them was bad. And so even in that picture of 11 men who followed the Lord faithfully, there's one who did not. More pure and less pure. Uh, dividing of wheat and tares. But finally, in Matthew 16, and this is the beauty, Jesus says, I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not, will not win against it. So we know those are both in balance. Now here's what I want to do. I know it's a church history class, but the bottom line for us as Christians is what does the word of God say about all of this? I want to take you for a few minutes. Uh, bear with me as we go through a number of scriptures that point out the very things that I just suggested to you that Jesus and the apostles 
are telling us in advance that the world that we were going to live in in the church age would be a world that the church would struggle yet ultimately succeed. Come along with me as we look at those scriptures. First of all, we're told, as I just said, the church will ultimately triumph in its mission. Matthew 16, 18, I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. Next, the church will experience apostasy and moralism. 1 Timothy 4, Paul says this, but the spirit explicitly says that in the latter times, some will fall away from the faith, paying attention to deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons by means of the hypocrisy of liars seared in their own conscience with a branding iron, men who forbid marriage and advocate abstaining from foods which God has created to be gratefully shared in by those who believe and know the truth. Uh, we're being warned here by Paul that in the latter days, what is that? Well, in the days in the church age at the end and up to the time of the rapture and going into the very last days, that the church is going to struggle. Some will come in the church who will try to bring about destruction and their doctrines of demons. Uh, we're also told that uh, people would teach the abstaining from foods which God has created to be gratefully shared in, like bacon. And nobody wants that kind of teaching in the church. Well, next, I would say that the church will be attacked from within, Scripture tells us. Acts chapter 20 tells us this. Be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to be shepherds of the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. I know, Paul says, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from among your own selves, men will arise speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after them. Therefore, he says to the elders of this church, be on the alert, remembering that night and day for a period of three years, I did not cease to admonish each one of you with tears. I want to remind you then that also those seven churches, which I mentioned uh, from the book of Revelation, uh, that Ephesus was a loveless church. You've lost your first love. Smyrna was a loyal church. Pergamum was lax in their behavior. Thyatira was, had become liberal. Sardis was lifeless. Philadelphia was a laboring and faithful church. And as I said before, Laodicea was a lukewarm church. Again, scripture in 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 1 to 3, or chapter 2, verses 1 to 3, the church will suffer the embarrassment of frauds and what I would call television preachers. Hear what he says. But false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will also be false teachers among you who will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them, bringing swift destruction upon themselves. Many will follow their sensuality, and because of them, the way of the truth will be maligned. And in their greed, they will exploit you with false words. Their judgments come from long ago, is not idle, and their destruction is not asleep. Let me say a few words about this to you. Let, let, let me show you the importance of this in church history. You're catching this, I know. You're catching, wow, Jesus and the apostles told us this, this church age, there's going to be a struggle within the visible church that Satan is going to try to destroy it and is going to make great inroads at times. But yet Christ has promised us that the church will not ultimately fail, but succeed in its mission. But look what Peter is warning us in 2 Peter. He is warning us of this, that some will come in who will be sensual, sexual sin. They'll try to take your money out of greed. This is the guys that we're talking about, that we often talk about television preachers. And the word of God will be maligned because people will think those people represent Christianity. And they'll say, look what Christians are like in your age. Look what Christians are like. But they're tares. They're false Christians. And so we must understand that Jesus warned us and the apostles warned us and told us the church was going to look like this. For further evidence, it says in 2 Timothy chapter 4, what I have said, the church will suffer the loss of sound doctrine and the rise of myths. Sound like something similar to today? For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance to their own desires, and they will turn away their ears from the truth and will turn aside to myths. 
Also, the church of the apostolic age struggled with these things, as I've already said. Second Timothy, Paul says, you are aware when he writes to Timothy, he says, you're aware of the fact that all who are in Asia, that is what we would say Western Turkey, turned away from me, among whom are Phygelius and Hermogenes. All had turned away from Paul? And then in Galatians 1, he says this to the Galatian church, I am amazed that you are so quickly deserting him who called you by the grace of Christ for a different gospel, which is really not another, only there are some who are disturbing you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. Um, you know, even the church of the apostolic age, as we said, struggled with this to such a degree that in Jude, he talks about false teachers who were taking over churches. For certain persons have crept in unnoticed, those who were long beforehand marked out for this condemnation, ungodly persons who turn the grace of our God into licentiousness and deny our only master and Lord, Jesus Christ. This is a lot of scripture. Um, I should say this at this point, that when Jesus specifically spoke on this, even before uh, the disciples and the apostles spoke on it in the rest of the New Testament, Jesus had laid the groundwork for this by telling us those parables and understanding the wheat and the tares, the sheep and the, and the goats. And so in Matthew 13, just, just listen to the words that Jesus is telling us about this age. Jesus presented another parable to them saying, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while his men were sleeping, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went away. But when the wheat sprouted and bore grain, then the tares became evident also. The slaves of the landover came and said to him, sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have tares? And he said to them, an enemy has done this. And the slaves said to him, do you want us then to go and gather them up? But he said, no, for while you are gathering up the tares, you may uproot the wheat with them. Allow both to grow together until the harvest. And in the time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, first gather up the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them but gather the wheat into my barn. Uh, what is Jesus telling us? Uh, Jesus is telling us this, that the age that we're going to live in, in the church age, is going to be filled with wheats and tares. And when we as Christians throughout history are at that angsted point where we truly, we're, we're pained by what's happening in church. We're, we're, we're pained by what happens in so many shallow churches or places where the name of God is not glorified. In, but they use the name of God. Jesus is saying he's not going to tear apart the visible church and only put the pure people in one little church, but he's going to allow in this age this blending. But at the end of the age, proper judgment, justice will happen. Uh, the truly righteous will be in his presence and rewarded. Those who are not, those who are false believers will not be in his presence. And so friends, God is just, God is good. Uh, the time will come when he is gonna take care of this issue, but it's not now. It's not now, it's yet future for us. So again, a last couple of verses on this matter. True Christians become more obvious in the midst of the struggle. As I said in 1 Corinthians 11, Paul says this, for there must also be factions among you. Why? So that those who are approved may become evident among you. And then finally, Jesus gathered his men after his resurrection and he gathered the 11 and he, for 40 days he told them about the kingdom of God. And they asked him this question. They said, when are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel? Uh, Acts chapter 1 is the beginning of a great church history book called the book of Acts. And they asked the question, is it going to be now? Are you going to restore the whole kingdom thing to us? And he tells them it's not going to happen right now. But in the meantime, you're going to be witnesses throughout the world. And then presumably as he had taught them, the kingdom will come. And in Acts chapter one, verse eight, Jesus says this, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and even to the remotest parts of the world.
Let me say this before I share uh, some guiding principles of how we're going to look at history. Don't lose the big point. Jesus and the apostles warned us in advance that the visible local church would struggle throughout the ages with wheats and tares, with false teachers and the attacks of Satan, but will ultimately succeed in every age to that which God has called it to do. And he's told us very clearly in Acts 1, he told the the apostles, in this age, the mission of the church is to preach the gospel throughout the whole world, and we would do that. And that's what God is doing. And yet, the church doesn't always look the way we think it should. Hey, a couple of real quick principles about studying history. Uh, This is a little technical, so this next section, hang with me. Seven of what I call guiding principles to help you understand what I'm about to try to do. And then from there, we'll look at the benefits and what we're going to study. So guiding principle one, by history, when I say the word history, I mean the events, evidence, examination, and explanation of God's outworking of his sovereign and redemptive plan for his glory and his people's good. Let let me say this, just so that you get a real idea of what those four key terms that start with E that I just used. History is, first of all, the event itself. Whatever happened is the actual history. We can't reproduce that moment no matter how hard we try then what is church history or what is the the goal of a historian? It is to then find the evidence which tells us as much as we can learn about the event and then take the evidence and examine it as closely and fairly and objectively as we can so that we understand what it really points to in the event. And then finally, once we believe that we have understood and explained the event and examined it, I'm sorry, then we explain the event. You know, when you take a church history course, here's what you're really getting. You're getting Dave Doyle's explanation of the examination I've done of history, of the evidence as I see it under God's word, and points me back to the events themselves to give explanation of them within a Christian worldview. And so basically, when we look at history, I'm recognizing that God is at work in such a way that he's left us clues to his handiwork in history. Number two, the guiding principle is this. The events that take place in time and space are neither random nor purposeless, but rather they are decreed by God. And as Romans 8 says, God causes all things to work together for good to those who love him and are called according to his purpose. Guiding principle three is simply this. The purpose described in Romans 8 is our conformity to the image of Christ. Every activity happening in history is happening as to God bringing his elect into conformity to Christ. It's not the only purpose, but it's a guiding principle for us to understand. Guiding principle four, biblical history is full of examples of God using unbelievers, such as Pharaoh and Judas and the devil for his purposes, as well as believers like Moses, David, Daniel, Esther, Mary, John the Baptist, Peter, Paul, and John. Now, when I say use, I don't mean in the same way. Uh, He uses uh, Christians to preach the gospel and live a holy life. But he uses people in history who oppose his purposes as God showing his marvelous power, his wrath, his justice, his holiness, and his decree. That is, he's working these things out for his own glory and the good of his people. So guiding principle, principle five is this. God's kingdom, his covenants, and his progressive revelation of his person and plan throughout the various dispensations gives meaning and background to all the evidence of the events that I've described that historians find such as common artifacts, writings, artwork, buildings, and bones. What's my point? It's very simple, that God has given us a theological understanding in scripture so that we can interpret the events of history. Number six, history's events and the evidence we discover must be examined in the light of God's revealed word. And seventh and finally, As we will discuss in a few moments, a knowledge of and appreciation for doctrine will go a long way in helping the earnest Christian unravel the mysteries of history before them. We must be truthful in our explanation of the events and the evidence so that we don't promote the extreme pitfalls that I've mentioned before. What are those? Again, as I said, a a Christian could be just as guilty as a non-Christian historian 
in taking the evidence of history and simply locking it into one of two things. Oh, the church has always been right and everything it has done and everyone else misunderstands. Or the church has failed and the church is failing and the church has never done what it was supposed to be. Neither of those extremes are true and they're not true in light of scripture. So let me do this as we look at the real purpose, why you should study church history as I'm introducing it. I wanna look at two major categories now. Uh, First of all, I'm gonna talk in a minute about what are we actually going to be studying, nine things, and then follow that up with 10 benefits of studying church history as we close down today. So come with me now as I look at the nine things that we're actually going to be studying. When we look at church history, we look at lenses from which we can look at the big picture. And I've named nine of them here, and they're simply this. First of all, we're going to look at the political situation in each of those ages of the church so that we can understand how the church and the state have functioned and should function, and in some cases should not function. Uh, Today is a case in point during the uh, pandemic that we actually are living in as I film this series. Uh, How does the church and the state relate to each other in the regulations and requirements being given out? Uh, Secondly, the propagation of the gospel, evangelism and missions in each age. How have Christians made the gospel clear in each age and been faithful to its content? Persecution. How have Christians suffered and how have they been willing to be in martyrdom to die for their faith? And how have Christians dealt with this throughout the ages? We'll look at the polity of the church at times. Uh, What has been the leadership structure? How how are churches formed? Uh, How do they govern themselves? What have been their worship styles? We'll look at polemics, that is, how they've defined apologetics, how they've defended Christian faith in each age. How have Christians done that? Uh, What's called praxis, and that is how it is not to be funny with the word, but how it's practiced. How Christians have had a worldview and a lifestyle. Uh, Presentation. How has the church educated and discipled its people? Uh, The Great Commission tells us to go into all the world and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and that Christ would be with us throughout this entire age. How has the church done that, and how successfully have they? We'll look at uh, the idea of people. We'll examine people who are examples to us, who will be excited and say, follow them insofar as they follow Christ, and also those who are a warning to us who have been professing Christian, in some case, Christians, because all sin, will see in their lives things that we want to be warned about. And then finally, I want to present to you in this series, not simply my explanation, but to look at some of the primary sources, some excerpts uh, from the writings of people, some artifacts, as you wish, of their verbal and uh, their evidence that they've left behind so that we can understand how they've walked through history. All right, then. I now want to present you, in that light, 10 people who I think would speak to us today. And if they were here with us in this kind of small environment, they would come in and I think they would tell us there's great benefit from understanding those who've walked before in the Christian life and see how they've struggled and how they've won. So I want to introduce you right now to 10 Christians and just a snippet, a quote or two, from things that they said at their time period and tell you just 10 benefits that you could have from studying church history together with me over these next several weeks. So come join me as we look at those. First of all, I just want to say that those 10 benefits of studying church history help us to learn 10 things. First of all, Francis Schaeffer explains to us that ideas have consequences. He says, in passing, we should note this curious mark of our own age. The only absolute allowed is the absolute insistence that there are no absolutes. Francis Schaeffer can help us to understand the ideas, intellectual ideas of this age and the consequences behind them. Irenaeus, who I mentioned earlier, uh, one of my favorite church fathers, explains to us how to answer heretics. Uh, He says this about the things that were happening in the 200s. Error never shows itself in its naked reality in order not to be discovered. On the contrary, 
it dresses elegantly so that the unweary may be led to believe that it is more truthful than the truth itself. Uh, I have my own phrase for this, and what I would call it is the Gnostic taco. And that is this. Uh, the taco, which usually has meat and lettuce and cheese in it, uh, a normal taco, um, cults and false religions come along and they build a taco that looks just like the taco you're used to. The difference is inside that shell is rancid meat and it will kill you. But it looks a lot like what you're used to. Cults don't come along and false religions don't come along and say, hey, we're totally this. They want to look and act like the truth and to gain people as adherents. Next, I'd point out that George Whitfield, the famous evangelist of the colonial age of America, teaches us how to preach the gospel with passion. He said, if you're going to walk with Jesus Christ, you're going to be opposed. In our days, he says of himself and his hearers, to be a true Christian is really to become a scandal. Do you feel that? Those who've walked before us 300 years ago in America, he was saying that. And he says, congregations are lifeless because dead men preach to them. I hope we're not one of those. One of my favorite people of the 20th century, Elizabeth Elliot, teaches us how the grace of God sustains us in suffering. As you know, her husband, Jim Elliot, and several other men were martyred as missionaries. And uh, Elizabeth Elliot has learned greatly from that, and she's written much and lived much on this. And here's what she says. God never withholds from his child that which his love and wisdom call good. God's refusals are always merciful, severe mercies at time, but mercies all the same. God never denies us our heart's desire except to give us something better. We can learn much from the example of women and men who have suffered in the past and have learned to love God more and their neighbor. William Wilberforce, the man that God used to uh, stamp out, uh, legally stamp out slavery in the British Empire, can teach us how to love our neighbors. Wilberforce tells us this, God Almighty has set before me two great objects, the suppression of the slave trade and the reformation of manners. And then this is something that's really struck me. He said, you may choose to look the other way, but you can never say again that you did not know. God used this man to change a society and he can use us in our own age. We're, we're not have to be famous, but they have laid a groundwork ahead of us to know we're not to live lives in which we see and act like it's not there, but we must respond to the age in which God has placed us and live appropriately within it. You know, Augustine, the famous church father, Saint Augustine, as some would call him, teaches us how God providentially directs history. He was alive at the time of the fall of the Roman Empire, and he wrote a book called The City of God, in which he explained that God has a city, and man has a city, and God's city is always going to win, no matter how man's city happens to look at a point in history. He saw the decline of what had become a Christian empire, which we'll talk about, and now has a decline in its fall. And he suggests to us, God is providentially working no matter what the outward look is. And that goes along with our theme that Jesus and the apostles told us. Augustine tells us this uh, regarding Christian living. There is no saint without a past and no sinner without a future. And that the truth is like a lion. You don't need to defend it. Let it loose and it will defend itself. That is something he would suggest to all ministers of the gospel is to use the word of God. Calvin, who lived during the time of the Reformation of the church, tells us how to defend the solas of the Reformation. The spirit of his defense of God's word can be seen in what he said in this, a dog barks when his master is attacked. I would be a coward if I saw that God's truth is attacked and yet would remain silent. And then Fanny Crosby. Fanny Crosby wrote over 8,000 hymns. Um, she, however, had one physical malady that you might already know, and that is Fanny Crosby was blind. Uh, she's written some of the great hymns 
of Christian life and faith. And this is what she said about her blindness that can help us to love God and to worship God more fully. She said this, if I had a choice, I would still choose to remain blind. For when I die, the first face I will ever see will be the face of my blessed Savior. Uh, Friends, God's people, like Fanny Crosby, who've gone before us, um, such dedication, such faith, uh, such a worldview that uplifted them in suffering. And uh, each time I've read that quote, I've been challenged in my own life to think of the beauty of that is, do I want something more than I want Jesus Christ? And good and godly people who are sinners that God has used in the past can teach us how to be devoted to Christ in both suffering and in success. Richard Baxter was a pastor in England during the time of the Puritan era. And Baxter had one thing that other ministers of his age typically did not, in that he was basically the pastor of a megachurch. Most Puritan pastors would have been pastors of churches that were um, smaller and uh, only required one minister or uh, a few and had elders with it. But he presided over a church within a town called Kidderminster, a church in which about 2,000 people in that parish, most of which attended his church, and most of which were saved under his ministry. In fact, Baxter teaches us how to train the next generation, and what he did was he took those fathers of those different houses and he trained them how to be godly men and how to lead their own families spiritually. And his passion was this. He said, I preached as never sure to preach again, and as a dying man to dying men. And finally, the tenth and final person that I would suggest as one of the benefits of why we study church history is learning how to stand alone if necessary. Athanasius uh, was the one who in the early church uh, in the 300s defended orthodox understanding that Jesus Christ was almighty God, uh, that he came and lived a perfect life, that he died he was buried and rose again the third day, but he was the, that Christ was the second person of the Trinity. He's equally God and equally man, and that he was no created being, but he is eternal and equal with the Father and the Holy Spirit. Uh, the church has taught that. The Word of God teaches that. But in that day, a man named Arius in Athanasius' time came and taught what we would call now the doctrine of the Jehovah's Witnesses, and namely that Christ was created and that he was not equal with the Father, and he was a created being. Many rallied under Arius and his false teaching to the point where Athanasius was kicked out as the pastor of his church seven different times because those Arians came in and the power of the government to push him out. And it is in that context someone came to him and said, Athanasius, the whole world is against you. And he responded in Latin, Athanasius contra mundum then Athanasius is against the world. God used him and others, but primarily Athanasius at the forefront of that to restore biblical Christianity and biblical thinking on the person of Christ in that century. And here's what he said about his relationship to the world. Let no one who hath renounced the world think that he hath given up some great thing. The whole earth set over against heaven's infinite is scant and poor. So I'm so glad that you have joined me today for a brief introduction to church history. I hope you got the main points and that you see where we're going in all of this. And to just recount all of that, there's a distinction between the local church and the universal church. Uh, The universal church is made up of all Christians from the time of Pentecost until the future rapture. And God is saving his church But the visible church does not always look good, but the universal church will succeed in the mission for which Christ had it. Look, we'll look at the church and its relationship to those nine things. We'll we'll do that in a Christian worldview with scripture over us so that we can diagnose that. But we'll look for the big ideas that are in each age and try to understand how they relate to ours while we look at these great benefits through others who've gone before us who teach us by example and in some cases warn us of what not to do. So I encourage you and I invite you to join me for the next lesson that we're doing, lesson two, the spread 
and Survival of Christianity, Part 1, where we look at the apostles, uh, those who followed Christ in the first century, and those he gave authority to write and to govern his church, and gave us the New Testament. And when they died, what we call the apostolic fathers, they weren't the fathers of the apostles, but those men who came after the apostles in the second century and continued to build the church. We'll be looking at that one period of time from 33 AD, the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, to about 150. And so please join us next time for this, and I invite you to come along for this life-changing adventure.